Okay, welcome, welcome. Apparently there's no announcer, so I will announce myself. I'm Brian, and this is my presentation about Darknet data analysis. I hope all of you will get something out of it. First about me, I work for the Department for Cybersecurity in Switzerland. Uh, I have a background in programming and penetration testing. I'm an AI enjoyer, and I'm lazy. That's why I am an AI enjoyer. Uh, I put uh, 56 slides, so I have to go fast, and I put in some Simpsons, me Simpsons memes in between so you don't fall asleep, hopefully. So, again, uh, what uh, are we going to talk about today? First of all, a bit of terminology, so we see what we are going to talk about. Then, why do I work on this? How do we find these leaks? How do we download them? How do we analyze them? And how would a perfect system look like? So, what exactly is a leak? So, basically, all data that is getting published, that should not really be published. So, there's a difference between structured data, like databases, credential lists, or unstructured data, where, like, ransomware groups just upload uh, a whole server. And most of the time, they contain some personal, personal identifiable information. Uh, sorry, PowerPoint uh, broke the formatting a little bit. So uh, first, just some example here on the breach forums, for example, there's a NATO database uh, getting sold, so there is commercial stuff, and here that's a structured data. Or there is, for example, the Fortinet leak, where there was just, hey, here's 440 gigabytes of stuff, uh, connect to my S3 bucket and download it. So you see, there are different kinds of uh, data. So why should we care about these data leaks? So basically, it's to protect ourselves, our companies, and keep people accountable. Because oftentimes, uh, companies get hacked, data gets uh, uploaded somewhere, and then nobody talks about it, or the media says, yeah, allegedly, something, something, maybe. But if you are a company and one of your partners got hacked, maybe it's smart to either ask them or look yourself, hey, do they maybe have some credentials for our servers still in their data? So, there is some reason to actually look into leaks. So what is the darknet? Basically, just everything you cannot directly find with your Google Chrome browser. You need a separate tool like I2P or Tor uh, to access it. But most of, the, of you probably already heard about the darknet, a uh, funny place where everything can happen. So who is leaking that stuff? There are a different group of people that leak stuff, like cyber criminal gangs. Uh, this is mostly the focus here. Uh, like Lockbit Play, 8Base, and all the other ones, they are financially motivated most of the time. So they are, uh, could do that. Then there's hacktivists, so people that have some kind of agenda, revenge against the company that they want to harm, so they upload data uh, to harm them. Or some state-sponsored actors also try to influence political stuff. So there's a lot of politics, crime drama going on. It's very interesting to see how the different uh, crime groups interact with each, with each other, but I'm not going to talk about that today. So there's a really good uh, podcast, Darknet Diaries, or the Ransom and Di Ransomware Diaries, where they talk about very interesting stuff, but not the topic today. So why is there stuff leaking? Like I said before, most of the time it's money. So either they're selling stuff directly, like the NATO leak, where he just said, we have some data, give us money, we give you the data or as a pressure for all the companies that get ransomware. Uh, in, back in the time, they got ransomware, they paid to get their data back, but now a lot of people have backups and don't really need to pay the ransom anymore. But if you can force them to pay the ransom by saying, hey, if you don't pay the ransom, I, we know that you can get your data back, but we also gonna upload a copy of it, more companies are motivated to pay because there could be damage to the reputation, damage to intellectual property, or other stuff. Also, um, political statements, uh, like the hacktivists, or revenge. Bottom line, stuff is getting leaked, um, regardless of how it is getting leaked. For us, the problem is it is now public, so we have to look at it and handle it. So, legality, it's, it's a bit complicated. It's a gray area. It depends also from country to country. Uh, some places it is legal to download data, look at it yourself. Some places it's not legal at all. Uh, it, 
there are morally some different uh, interpretations. Like if you just access it to see if you are affected, it's maybe uh, less of a problem. But of course, if you access it to then abuse the credentials or use them to do phishing or whatever, probably not going to be a good idea. Then also sharing knowledge versus sharing data. Sometimes it's okay to talk about and say, hey, someone got affected and it's actually really bad. And sometimes uh, even that can be a problem, as we see in the recent example, where a city in Ohio got uh, ransomware and some data leaked, but everybody said, no, no I'm not gonna, it's not critical data. And then one researcher actually looked at it and found out, no, no, it's, it's really bad. And instead of thanking the researcher for actually doing the work, they just sued him because he told the media that, no, it's really bad. So um, play around with it, but be careful. Be careful what you do, be careful who you talk to about what you do, um, and don't hold me accountable, I warned you. So why do I work on this? Um, we as the Swiss government, but in the rest of the presentation I'm doing it as my own person, just for legal reasons. Uh, we got a problem last year called uh, Xplain, which is one of a company that is a supplier for specialized software in Switzerland, and they got hacked. And ransomware and data got leaked. So then initially we, saw, we looked at the contracts and saw that yeah, the company should not have any critical data so it should not be a problem for us. But then some media actually looked into it and found no, it, it is a problem. And then the people came to us and said, hey, could you maybe yourself look at the data and see how big the problem actually is? So then we needed to learn how do we find that data, how do we download it, and how do we find out what is actually a problem inside of that. Um, yeah, so in the end, it really was a problem. There were 65,000 documents and a lot of stuff that, uh, that affected our police system, a lot of data from private persons, so it really was a problem. We did a whole report on it, uh, published that, and it helped a lot by us going actually through the data and looking at what problematic stuff there is. So my personal journey in that topic. So I started working on the darknet leak stuff uh, on work, but I found it really interesting really fast because you feel kind of like an investigator, special agent looking through hidden stuff. So I like that. And I'm also, I all, always like scraping uh, an, an analysis of big data, having a challenge that you need to work through. And I also like doing lots of scripts. That's why I call myself a uh, script kitty. So there's a lot of stuff to try out, to automate. It's not a solved challenge yet, so there's still a lot of potential to do uh, fun stuff. So how do I find these leaks? So we have the scenario. There is a specific leak we heard about. Um, we heard about one company getting hacked, so what do we do now? First of all, know if that is even relevant to you if you can. So maybe look into your supplier management. If you have something like that, look into your partner list and see what companies uh, work together with us, who could even be an interesting target for us to look at. That was a big problem we had because uh, we are so big that we don't really know who could have sensitive data from us. So do that homework in advance. It's uh, really good. At least if you are a company, think about who you work with, who could have data from you. And then the correct thing to do is contact the company. They are probably already in a, in a, big, uh, in a big mess. They have probably already have lawyers, whatever. But still, best case scenario, they give you all their data or they have a look at it. But also be a bit skeptical because sometimes they say, yeah, yeah. Uh, everything was compliant, compliant, we don't have any sensitive data, but still uh, you actually find out later there, there is a problem. So we know company X is, uh, is affected, so let's try to find out who hacked them, who leaked them. So maybe based on the communication from the company, we find out uh, was it ransomware, was it not ransomware, who could it have been? And then we go to specific websites, Telegram channels, and see if that name of the company pops up somewhere. Uh, bottom 
sentence, there's always either a lot of hype or none at all. So either companies talk a lot about it or also press hype up stuff a lot, but then it's not even relevant in the end, or nobody talks about it, but if you would have actually looked at it, it could have been very bad. So always be skeptical and verify yourself. So this is for, we know a company got hacked, we want to try to find a specific leak, but basically, maybe we want to monitor everything and see before the media talks about it. There are some useful open source tools that try to scrape some leak sites. These are all focused on the ransomware sites, like Ransom Log, Ransomware Live, Ransom Watch. All three work a bit different. All three have their code on GitHub. And there are also commercial solutions, like BreachSense. I have not tried that out but also other ones, uh, but I'm always a big fan of the free and open source stuff. Um, here we see an example how ransom look looks. It just lists out these are the last companies affected and which group did uh, leak them. Then other ones also have a lot of numbers on them, but be a bit careful there. There are some ransomware sites or groups that are known to recycle old leaks or just put up leaks that are not really uh, a real leak, just so they look more important, because all the ransomware gangs are trying to get new affiliates working for them, so they try to fake their numbers a little bit to seem more important. But that's, again, more of the politics side, not really what I'm interested in. But one problem the, they mostly have is they have very limited data. For example, here, uh, if I see the, the explain, they just say, yeah, explain got hacked from play and what date. There's a, a link to it and the screenshot from the page, but it just updated once. So we wanted to know, is there anything changing? Are they uploading new stuff? So I had to build my own tool. This is my play watcher, which basically scrapes the play website every 15 minutes or so and gets everything that is up there including all the changes. So now, for example, our explain case, I know it's a bit small, but there is like all the description and links, and we see that it changed quite a bit. They moved around the download servers, they changed the descriptions a bit, they changed the amount of data that they listed, and it even got changed um, four months later, uh, some description. So it's interesting, maybe also for forensic, to see how is the darknet uh, page changing? Are they claiming something new? Or are they even uploading new stuff or removing stuff? We also tracked the download links and saw that there are a lot of different download links getting published, probably every time there's an old server going offline or something. And we tracked all the number of files, how big the files exactly are to see if they change something. Uh, one thing we saw was that they uploaded a broken archive and because we had that tool we saw the moment that they uploaded the new fixed one and could download it very fast to fix our uh, copy of the data. So sometimes it makes sense to build your own tool. So how do we uh, build uh, our own tool? Very basic demo. Let's uh, see if that works. So I have uh, the same code here and I'm opening a terminal. So I want to do a curl. It basically just downloads the, the page. I do it, uh, the, this onion page, and we see, oh no, dot onion is not a, real, not a real address. So we need a proxy to actually connect to the Tor network. But we, before we start that, there is a really good tool which helped us a lot uh, create Torque, which is basically creating a, a Tor configuration by checking all the Tor servers and how fast they are. There is a public database. And we now say exactly that we only want the fastest server to connect to. We only want uh, nodes that are within the country that we are currently in, which helps speed up Tor a lot. It's really bad for anonymi anonymity, so don't do it if you want to stay hidden, but it can speed up downloads a lot. So uh, let's hope the, the Wi-Fi here works a bit faster else we might have a problem. But it should now download that. Then after that, we're going to start up a Docker file. Just going to start it again, how it works faster. It's always the demo effect. 
Yeah. Okay, it now saved that Tor config. We see if we look at it here that it only uses the 1000 fastest guard, fastest guards, and yeah, of course, it's a big file now. Uh, exclude all the slowest relays and whatever. So this helps speed up your Tor browsing a lot. So let's do that. I added in some more config stuff I need. And then I just start up a Docker container that has a simple proxy. So it uses now our config that we have, connects to the Tor network. And now we can do the curl command and say, please use that proxy we just started in the Docker. And then we should get the HTML back. It's always a bit random how fast it is, and how, but yeah, we now have the HTML of the explain page. And basically what my tool does is it goes through all the different listed ones, stores all the HTML content, parses it a bit, puts it in a database. Very simple. And this is nice, but there always is a but. So this would have been the demo if it didn't work, but it worked. There was someone uh, having the smart idea of implementing JavaScript in Tor, which is uh, really stupid, because now some darknet pages that get DDoSed sometimes implemented some kind of queue system, and even worse, they implemented a captcha. Yeah, that, that sucks. So we have to break it. We have to build a better parsing bot. So the challenge is some pages use JavaScript, they use WebSockets, they use captcha checks. So please, uh, if uh, some ransomware site developers are here, just make an API that, that works. It would make our life easier. So we use Playwright. There are some alternatives like Selenium. It's basically just an automated browser where we can code the browser what it should do. So let's break these captures. I first had to download a lot of captures and analyze them a bit to see how do they work. And I noticed that it's always the same number of uh, of characters. Also, they don't care about small, uh, small case or large case. So uh, me being me, I uh, trained an AI. So let's see if it works. I, tra I spend one, like one hour doing a manual capture entry to train the model, which was fun. But now I have a Python script, which when I run it, it should hopefully um, spin up uh, a Chromium browser that is already connecting via our setup Tor proxy and going through the Clop Darknet page. Exactly. And because it's just a normal Chromium browser, it will also um, succeed with the automated check. There's a captcha, it enters in the text. And it should redirect us now to the, to the real file. Now what my script does is uh, just going through every page here, downloading all the information. I will stop that now. And in our folder, we should now have an archive. If we let it run for longer, it would have more content with screenshots of all the pages and all the pages as an offline copy so I can uh, analyze or browse them. So even the anti-automization is not safe from AI. Yeah, so there is a possibility to automate everything and build like complex systems that uh, I needed to spend uh, multiple days on just to get all the data and if they now see the talk and change their captcha, I have to do it all again. So sometimes it's easier to just do manual work. Uh, we had some cases of ransomware where we just, I just set up a calendar reminder for me the, to check every day, go to the website, see if something changed or not. Because some things are not that critical, so it's just easier to do it manually yourself than spend hours automating stuff. So, what kind of download and uh, download pages and download kinds are there? First of all, there are the torrents. 
there are some clear net torrents, some dark net torrents. So some pay, uh, some torrents work just you can download the magnet link or use the magnet link or download the torrent file, connect to it normally with your torrent uh, client and it just downloads. And sometimes the, all the initial peers are only reachable over uh, over the Tor network or the I2P network, so you need to configure your download client there. Uh, if it's clear net, use some seed boxes or services like Real Debrit, which is basically kind of a seed box, but if someone else already downloaded the, that torrent through their service, they just serve you the files uh, very fast, which uh, is nice. Also, what sometimes helps is adding more trackers manually, just as a, as a tip there. There are some uh, pre-configured downloaders like the ARIA 2C Onion downloader that already has all the Tor proxy stuff built in. So if you just need to do it quickly, stuff like that works. Now, there are also the archive files like the example with the Xplain. There we have a small or smaller number of multi-gig files, which if you use Tor before, you know you cannot just go with the Tor browser to a page, click download, and then it says, please wait uh, five days until one file is downloaded. So you can use download managers like JDownloader or ARIA2C again, uh, 2 again, because they are able to continue downloads or you're able to download the same file using multiple connections. That really speeds up. But then also you have to know that there is only one source server. Um, so the more people trying to download a file, the slower it gets. So either be very fast using your own auto automatization tools or try to download older stuff that probably nobody is downloading anymore. If you know there are multiple victims of something, try to speak with each other, only download it once, don't have everybody download it, else it just gets slower for everyone. But we also had it that one leak was like over a terabyte and we had to download it for 20 days just because it was so slow. So it's important to start fast, start early. And one newer addition is that they just do directory listings, which is very interesting because you can already f browse all the files. If, because if there are archives, you just see, oh, there's one terabyte of archives. I need to download one terabyte to even see what is inside them, or at least download one full package. And with the directory listings that look kind of like this, you can just browse it and then click on one file. Uh, it's easier, for example, for the media to go through it, see maybe, oh, that's an interesting looking file and download the, only download that. But it's kind of hard to download everything because you get the latency every time you have to do something. Uh, also, sometimes they even have the capture checked before the directory listing so it gets really slow. Uh, if they don't have anything like that, just use veget-m to mirror the whole page. That's very nice. And some ransomware um, like I think Black Basta, they upload a copy to the ClearNet, so it's really fast to download. But the uh, pages normally get taken down pretty fast. So again, if you have some automatization to get the data first, you are in luck. So let's look at some actual data. And sorry, I'm speaking very fast. I'm noticing um, going through the slides a lot. But then there's more question, uh, more time for questions. So first, a warning. Of course, there is the potential for malware. You're downloading random stuff from the internet. Maybe don't run it on your productive machine. I have not really seen any good Trojans hidden in there by the ransomware group themselves. But then again, if they are good, I probably haven't found them. But uh, I saw a lot of sof software being cracked and used by companies, even big companies. Sometimes have some uh, cracks somewhere which uh, your antivirus will find and uh, alert you about. So here, for example, we have the case study of hackers claim to have leaked 1.1 terabyte of Disney Slack messages. So let's uh, pretend that I'm a Disney employee and I want to know, is this uh, affecting my personal Slack message or is it only group messages? Or is there even data leaked? Because all the media just said, claim, maybe. So let's investigate if that is true or not. So first we have to identify who leaked it. Uh, the media already said it's null bulge. So uh, let's find the page and oh, yeah, the page already got suspended. But it's a clear net page, it's not a dark net. So what do we do? We go to the web archive and we find an archive copy of it. 
There we find a magnet link, which is just a, a short torrent hash that we can use to download the torrent. And we put that into like a seed box service, as I mentioned before. And someone else already put that in there, so I was just able to download that one terabyte pretty fast from their CDN. And now I have 1.22 terabyte archive file on my computer, hypothetically, of course. Uh, also interesting, file sizes are not the same everywhere. That's probably a talk for uh, all on its own, but on Mac, the file sizes are not always the same as on Linux and on Windows. And also, uh, yeah, it, it's a difficult topic. It's not 1.1 terabyte, it's 1.22 on my system. And if you extract it, it's even bigger. So yeah, it's, it's difficult because when we did our report, they asked us, OK, how big exactly is it? And I said, well, it depends. <laughs> They leaked some archives, but if you pack out the archives and then there are archives in the archives, how far do you want to go? So now we looked at it and there is a lot of uh, JSON documents, basically just extracts from the, uh, from the Slack channel and some also attachments. Uh, we saw that the, um, we quickly made a script to just get all the, the channel information. I know it's uh, small again, but the first one is just some D&D uh, group that they have uh, inside uh, Disney. And the other one sounds a bit more interesting. VMs moving to the cloud. Maybe they uploaded some credentials there. But for us, if we say we are an employee of Disney, we can now be assured, yeah, they did not leak our private messages. And whatever I sent to my coworker is still safe. So let's uh, look a bit more at a proper leak. So here we have the example of the explain data, which of course is all fake. This is not real. So first, uh, we have to understand the structure. So I downloaded here the explain, like all the archives. I extracted them, and now I see this here. Uh, it is in German, but yeah, it's not really that important. But we see there's some management cases. There are some stuff that is codenamed with some projects that we know existed for the company. So we try to understand what exactly did the hackers copy. And in this case, they probably copied like the one share where every user has access. And what is even worse, they also copied all the user homes, which we will see on the next slide. They also have like backups uh, and from the company. There were some old uh, system backups, which we first had to even get the software to actually look at it. So first thing we do. Uh, is, is trying to find out what did they all copy, and it looks like they copied pretty much everything. So let's look, for example, at the user homes, because they're always very interesting. You see they have backups of desktops, backup of our download folder. They have a passwords.txt, password. Uh, yeah, you find a lot of stuff in the user directories, because uh, uh, if we contact the company and ask them, hey, what data do you have? They normally say, yeah, we have this and this data in our company uh, folder. But yeah, they don't know what the users actually have saved. And there's a lot of the times where there are sensitive data being there because they needed to download a database to migrate it to another server, and they just never deleted the original download. So please uh, help your customers and your employees to clean up their stuff. Maybe just delete it randomly or so. Let's see what happens. So what are some search techniques? What are some tips and tricks if you download a lot of data and want to look at it? First of all, load it into Explorer, Finder, whatever tool of your choice. Try to get a feel for it, because it's, it's not a very technical work. It's kind of a feely boy, uh, work, because you have to think how an employee there thinks. Then try to search for your company name. Also search for like email handles or other known keywords that are maybe unique to your company. Uh, check their business customer folders, of course. Uh, maybe inside there you find that they have internal business or internal, internal name for projects that they worked on with your company. Uh, that is always interesting because now you have other things to search for. Also search for the finance folders. Uh, there you might be able to identify which user or which employee of the company worked on your projects that you are involved with, and then go directly to that user directory to see if they have some, uh, some lazy stuff lying around there. 
Then if you want to be fast, then prioritize the, the biggest files first. Normally there are dumps of databases or backups. That is interesting. But also search for the smallest files because a lot of the time in the smallest files, some employee writes, hey, uh, the password for FTP server is this and this. Um, and also keep the context in mind. Uh, we did some analysis and then we had uh, some partner of us looking through the files and they found one encrypted zip file. And they said, yeah, we tried to crack it with our uh, brute force machine, but we could not uh, crack the password. Uh, we found that this uh, encrypted zip is in the, in the leak. And I just opened it up in my explorer and found that n right next to that zip file is a, is, a, is a document containing the password. But because they only looked at the, at the files uh, based on grep or whatever, they uh, did not see that there's actually a password file right next to it. It was uh, very fun explaining to them that we have a very good AI uh, br brute force cluster. So maybe if you want to do it a bit more professional, you need some kind of indexing solution because grep is very limited on how fast your uh, disk is, how good your CPU is. So better tools are essential. Uh, there are some professional tools I worked with, like Nuix, which is a forensic software. It is very nice because you have multi-user management, you can give roles, everybody can work on it, but it is not very flexible. It's also more for like the police, if they get a copy of a computer to find specific stuff. It's not really that good if you want to look at everything. They also have a problem that it's not easy to find all the context or the references to a file. So I had to build my own system for, uh, for some case. Brian's amazing custom search, which basically is very easy. Uh, there's a tool called FS Crawler, which takes a directory. It's, uh, all the tools are open source, or I don't know if Elastic now is open source on, or open source or not, but uh, there are uh, open source or other alternatives that work as well. So basically, it, you can give it a folder, and it goes through all the files, uh, and then sends it to Apache Tika, which is a very nice tool. Basically, it's trying to extract clear text from pretty much every format there is. So you can give it um, a PDF file and it tries to extract all the metadata and text from there. You can give it a, a doc file, you can give it some SQLite database and it tries to extract all the clear text, which is very good because now you can search on the clear text. It can also do OCR uh, on images. It's not really that good with video, but I think they're working on it. And then I put that all into a big Elasticsearch um, database that is indexed. So now I can search for it very fast. I can do regex and fuzzy search and all that kind of stuff. So this is a relatively simple so you, solution that you can build yourself for free, uh, host it offline, and it works pretty good. So for example, here we have uh, xlogin.zip. Uh, because that was not extracted normally, but Tika does extract that and you see all the content of it. Now you can also search um, through the zip files because you don't want to extract everything. Uh, for example, if you have an exe file, do you want to extract the exe file, yes or not? If it's just a copy of FileZilla, you don't want to extract it. If it's a copy of some proprietary software, maybe you want to look at it because there could be some config. So Apache Tika just does everything, and you have it indexed. That's very nice. So some more advanced strategies. Try to use like regular expressions to find, uh, find different kind of PII. Uh, regular expressions always a difficult topic, but some people like them, some not. Uh, try to do fuzzy matching, for example, with Elasticsearch. It's possible, and choose effective keywords. We had some uh, company that worked with us saying, yeah, we have a list of keywords. Can you look for them inside of the dump? And they send us words that are like software. So yeah, there, there, is so, there are 5,000 documents naming software. So, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, you have to think about what could be something unique to data that affects you. Then sometimes you have like really, really big files. Uh, so you have to think a bit, how do we want to analyze them? Do we have machines that have enough memory that can actively look through them? Or do we need to chunk them, so cut them in pieces, only look at the header? Uh, and you have to deal with obscure formats. Like there was one case where we had a, 
very old Oracle database dump and there was just like no tool that at least we could find that was able to read it and we had to buy for uh, like $100 from some obscure website some uh, Oracle database to CSV extraction tool and uh, we were 50-50 if we are getting scammed or not but in the end it worked. So yeah, you have to handle stuff like that and if you don't want to reverse engineer or don't have time to reverse engineer you, uh, yeah, good luck trying out stuff. Also, there were, was like an old version of uh, Jira, like a very old one where it was difficult to get it set up to import the uh, backup to actually look through it efficiently. There are always interesting cases like that. Uh, but in the end, we got it working. We had a, a virtual image of an old Jira instance or a Confluence instance, it was actually. And then we had some people looking manually through every page to see if there is something interesting. And there was like one page with uh, FTP, passwords, and logins. And so they looked through all of them and said, yeah, now we disabled them all. And then I asked them, did you also look at the history? Because you can have histories in that, oh, yeah, no, uh, yeah, do the work again, please. So what I like to do if I have to do it myself and quickly, I create a copy of the data and just try to guess and delete everything that does not seem interesting. So then I have quickly way less data. If I see, oh, this, is, uh, this data regards a company that is not affiliated with us, just delete that folder, and then I start doing all the indexing and searching. Maybe I miss something important, possible, but in the end I save a lot of time. You always have to do the trade-off between accuracy and finding the important critical stuff. So is AI the solution? I ask myself as a lazy person, of course, and I tried out a lot of different, different stuff there. So first, in one case we had, we used uh, the NUIC system to actually manually tag a lot of the files. Like all of the 65,000 files were manually reviewed by a person that clicked, uh, is this relevant, is this containing PII? And then we trained uh, a basic, I think it was a, a basic text classifier on that data to try to see can we now classify future stuff with it. And the answer is sadly no, it's, it's really difficult for an AI to know if something is critical or not. Because you can state uh, five times critical and it thinks it's critical, but it could also be uh, yeah, some kind of uh, SSH key, private key, and then the AI thinks, yeah, it's just noise, or ah, this looks the same like a base 64 encoded image to the AI. <laughs> so it's very hard to do that. Also, AI scales very bad with lots of data. All of the LLMs are still very limited in the context size. You cannot just put in one terabyte of data. Even some directory trees are very hard for the AI to process. So I tried to put in a directory tree that, hey, could you tell me where there might be interesting information? And it just said, yeah, in the fin financial might be something interesting. Yeah, but I'm interested in the technical stuff. And yeah, it, lots of arguments. You don't really save time with that, maybe in the future. Uh, it can be good to uh, create some quick parser scripts if you say, hey, I have this uh, obscure format. Can you? do a script that parses it into CSV. Sometimes it works, but at least with Oracle database, it had no idea what I'm talking about. But yeah, use it uh, wisely. So what are some proposed improvements in the future? Uh, initially, when I, uh, I, I registered for this talk, I thought that, oh yeah, I'm gonna use all the time between the submission and the talk to actually program a very good open source solution, but uh, in the end, life happens, and I did not. I was lazy. But implement better searching algorithms. So try to do better fuzzy matching, try to do better search compression. Because we sometimes have it that a new company comes and says, hey, you analyzed that leak. Could you say if we are also affected? And then basically, no, we now have to do the work all over again. So if there are like some smart way to do like listing of all the affected entities that could be very interesting, but so far I have not found a perfect solution there. Then also similarity search, I experimented a bit with that. For example, one company really liked FileZilla Portable and they just copied it into basically every folder everywhere. And so I just searched for all the copies of FileZilla and deleted them all and I already saved a lot of disk space. Then some advanced PII detection. The regex really don't work that great, as you probably know. 
There are some interesting AI-based PII detectors like the Presidio from Microsoft that you can also run offline that tries to find out does this document contain a phone number, does it contain social security numbers and so on. So maybe something that implements that could be really good and something to think about. So in conclusion, darknet leaks are ever evolving. So we saw that different people are leaking stuff, new people start to leak stuff, and also the how they publish data is changing. Initially, there were only archives directly uploaded, and now there are torrents and the directory listings and challenges with the uh, captchas and so on. So sometimes you just have to, to really look into it. Then also staying up to date is crucial, and don't rely on information from other too much. I think that is what is behind of the, of the Simpsons image there. So we saw that media sometimes says, yeah, maybe something happened, or no, nothing happens, as the major mayor stated for the Ohio case. And then in reality, it was really bad. So maybe if it's something that could be critical for your company, try to look into it. Sometimes it's smarter to do the work manually instead of trying to automate everything. And then also try to be ethical. We are in a gray area. Don't do anything illegal, as I have to tell you but also try to be smart. Call to action, always be learning. There, this is a very interesting topic. Uh, you have so many things. You learn automation, you learn AI stuff, you learn web scraping, you learn big data, all the buzzwords that help you get a job you can do with this. And then we need more people developing better and more open source tools. So please uh, contribute. And with that, I will now take your questions. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Uh, it's a remark for everyone wondering what you could do if you find sensible information and you want to tell the responsible persons but you are uh, afraid that they might be very litigious, like in the Ohio case. Um, there are people who can help you out with that. Um, uh, if you live in Germany or in Switzerland, there are organizations like the CCC, like Digital Courage, etc., that can help you. Uh, there are similar organizations all over the world. Uh, I think the EFF has done work like this. And uh, last but not least, uh, if you have journalists that you think you can trust, or better said, that you know you can trust, uh, you can always contact those. You don't have to do the responsible disclosure in that case yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so thank you for the talk. Um, I'm interested in the, in the dark net part of, of this. So um, uh, w w what's your process when, when you get there? I mean, I've installed Tor myself, but I, I don't know what to do there. So you, you, you uh, mentioned the dark wiki or something. I mean, h how, how do you get to the actual, like, w w where, w w where the stuff is happening? You know, where to get the latest info about uh, WhatsApp? Thank you. Um, exactly, yeah, for, for accessing the darknet, just using the Tor project, Tor project's Tor browser is the easiest. And then if you want to actually find the pages, then uh, some of the indexers, um, where do we have those? Like Ransom Log, Ransom Life, Ransom Watch, they have lists of, uh, of all the current uh, ransomware groups and where the, where or what their current pages are, because that's also changing. Also, you can find by Googling some Telegram channels of that publish the current links, or uh, Reddit is also normally pretty fast with updating their stuff. Yeah, but always be careful. But yeah. if you uh, type in whatever the name is you want to find, and .onion, you normally find somewhere where there is a reference to where you want to go. Thank you. For searching, have you thought about using some kind of a desktop search solution? I mean, there is a lot of them, like uh, 
full text search for the desktop, which can yeah. index documents, all that stuff, right? Yes, so yeah, there, there I, uh, I tried out, uh, like the one built-in on macOS Spotlight is already pretty good at parsing like PDFs and doc files, but then they don't uh, search inside of zips, or then you always have different edge cases that are not covered by the desktop ones. It's very good if you just want to see, is there a file that contains a, a FTP password, or if there is a, an Excel file with, with my personal data in there, but if you want to really get into it, you have to do a bit more forensic work that is not covered by the normal desktop full text index. Uh, yeah, but it, to just get a feel for it, it's very uh, easy to do and fast to just do that on desktop. But if you try to index one terabyte of data, even a desktop is also slow, so you might as well do a right, the right solution. Uh, one question also. Uh, we talked about discovering PII data, which can be pretty simple, but um, in your personal experience, um, have you found uh, some useful way to, for example, to detect various of authentication tokens, especially ones which have unlimited time to live, right? Which can be then used in some reverse engineering attacks. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, like if there are like some tokens. That's right. Or, yeah. Different yeah, we, we try to do some like entropy searching and try to find, yeah, if there is a high entropy string, probably could be a token, it could be a secret. Um, there is a lot of garbage data. Also, there's uh, like one company uh, create, uh, really like to create their own proprietary file formats for everything, which then like, really messed with our, uh, with our parsers. So, yeah, it is not a solved question, but uh, there are people searching for secrets on GitHub and so on, and some of the tools that they use also work very good for local, local files. More questions? Yes. Yeah, it was a bit faster, so we have a lot of question time. I'd like to send you around. Um, <clears throat> about the, uh, you mentioned that, there, that uh, you had issues with Grab taking up time and effort and stuff like that. Uh, there are tools uh, like right now, or before it parallel, there was this talk about uh, Rust-based command line tools. And for Grab, I can only recommend Rip Grab. It's um, I, I don't know how they do it. It's just fucking fast. Um, and about the high entropy thing, if you uh, also if you have an organization, uh, do you, if you have uh, spare time on Friday afternoon and you want to open a security incident, um, just run a high, high entropy recognition tool over your uh, uh, company wide uh, network share thingy or something like that. You will have a shit ton of fun. Also, things like like all the all the stuff that you would use in that case if you were uh, if you were affected, run it through internal company stuff, and you will find many non-compliant uh, directories. Uh, yeah, it depends how much fun you want to have. Yeah, the, there is really a, a lot of stuff to optimize. Uh, I think also grep is like single-threaded and only works on one one core uh, per default, and there's some other tools that can do it then in parallel. So there's a lot of optimization stuff. Also, you can do is, uh, things like having multiple SSDs in RAID 0 to speed it up. There's like so much things to optimize. It's really for someone that uh, likes to go down rabbit holes, it's really a very nice uh, topic. Any more questions? Come on, people, show some. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to dig in the gray zone area. Um, how, could you, how could you be GDRP when you store data about other companies, maybe about other companies that you own? So did I understand correctly, how do I be uh, safe when I store data or in the, from the gray area? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, like what I do at work, we have the, the legal basis to do it, um, in Switzerland at least, so uh, I try to be safe there. Privately, of course, I don't do anything uh, officially. But yeah, be, be smart uh, about what you do. I mean, 
data is public anyway. Some people say, yeah, somebody already leaked it. Who cares? Uh, I think still don't be stupid and uh, have it on like an open FTP server or whatever. Try to be a bit smart about it. And also, if you don't need it anymore, maybe delete it. Uh, it's smarter than uh, it's getting leaked from you. Looks bad. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem. It's being being leaked from you uh, is uh, actually the, the problem of the, the gray area. So I just wanted, how do you do that? But I think you answered. Thank you. Do you have another question? Good. Uh, if no other questions, let's give a big hand to Brian. Thank, Thank you so. very much.